Good morning and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, a health policy reporter here at The Post and author of the Health 202 newsletter. And this morning we're going to be talking about lessons learned from the coronavirus pandemic. And for my first guest, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Kurt Newman. Uh, to the program and he's the president and ceo of children's national hospital and he's with us to talk about how children are being affected by the coronavirus thank you so much for joining us dr newman great to see you Paige. thank you so a lot to talk about here but i want to lay out some numbers for our audience first because i know this perspective is important when we're talking about kids and coronavirus uh, a little more than 2,000 kids under age 18 have been hospitalized for covid 19 uh, and nearly 300 have died from the illness and that's uh roughly over the last year and i'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about the impacts that you've seen on kids particularly as i presume you've seen some of them arrive at your own hospital uh, absolutely, and and thank you for uh, uh, spending some time on this topic. You know, I think there was a, a myth that that started early with the pandemic that uh, children weren't affected. And what we've learned is that uh, children may not be seen as affected clinically. Uh, and you see all the the stories in the media uh, in terms of adults and adult hospitals. But early on, we realized that that just wasn't true, that, that children were affected. And as your statistics pointed out, and what we've seen here in Washington, D.C., uh, there's been a major impact. Uh, we've seen over 2,000 children uh, uh, that tested positive for the coronavirus. Uh, uh, 400 of those required hospitalization, and many of those required I, uh, being in the ICU. Now, the good news is uh, we really haven't had any deaths, although there have been some reported around the country. But those kids have gotten very, very sick. And another thing we learned uh, very early on was that there are some unique characteristics of the virus impacting children. There's a syndrome called MISC or multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. It's really uh, uh, been localized to, to children and happens a few weeks after uh, the viral infection. And boy, uh, do those kids get really sick and we're still seeing that. Uh, so th there were a lot of things about the virus and we're still uh, learning more and more. And then a big impact that people don't think about as much is the impact on mental health, behavioral health. And some of those are gonna be really, really long-term in children and we don't have a vaccine for that. Well, and I, I want to talk about the, the impact on children's mental health in a minute. Uh, but first, let me ask you this. I know that we do see a small group of children, unfortunately, die from the seasonal flu every year. And actually, uh, in a small bit of good news, I know those deaths have been down this year from seasonal flu because presumably kids aren't out and about. But can you compare what's the effect of COVID-19 on children compared to the seasonal flu? Well, it... Uh... Uh, is a great question, uh, of Paige, and, and what you see, and, and, and it's been pretty amazing, uh, shouldn't be, but public health measures work. And so we haven't been seeing the kind of flu that we ordinarily would see or other respiratory viruses like RSV, which can also be a real uh, killer in children. And asthma is way down. So these the impact of kids hand washing, uh, being apart from uh, other children, not being in school maybe, has had a huge impact and our emergency uh, volumes are down. And frankly, that's really good news. But on the other hand, uh, we do uh, see that trade-off with the uh, uh, pandemic and this virus. We don't know what's going to happen with uh, these variants that are coming forward. Uh, so, it, you know, it just may be too early uh, to compare, you know, to make it an apples to apples comparison uh, I think they both have, uh, there's a lot of concern about either uh, virus. Hopefully we'll get into a situation where we have the vaccines that work no matter what uh, the virus does. But right now it's a very uh, concerning uh, uh, situation uh, uh, as we look forward to, you know, how our children, what are the longer term impacts of having this uh, virus? And those studies need to be done and we're doing them. We know with adults that there's a strong link between serious illness from COVID-19 and, and comorbidities such as obesity, diabetes, other things. What have you observed in kids? Have you seen that your, your, your patients there have had other conditions that may have made them more vulnerable to, to serious disease there? 
Yeah, that's a terrific observation. And we have seen that, uh, that uh, children with pre-existing uh, conditions are at a higher risk. Uh, but there are healthy children too that uh, uh, contract this and can get very, very sick very, very quickly. The other thing that we uh, discovered uh, and we set up a drive-through walk-up testing center very early on in the days, back in March. You know, we saw our first uh, patient confirmed uh, a year and two days ago. Uh, but from that testing site and all the other things we've done, we found that a major risk factor is that black and brown children are at much higher risk. Their testing positivity was much higher and the impact of the disease also uh, was more impactful. So that's something we're studying uh, as well. We're very concerned about that uh, and don't have the answers on that. But it, it, it really uh, raises the question that some of the disparities we see in healthcare in general that pre-existed uh, the virus are becoming exacerbated by, by the virus. And, and certainly it's something we wanna pay a lot more attention to and invest uh, in, in studying and understanding why that is. I want to ask you about schools for a minute because I'm sure you've seen uh, this is a really buzzy topic right now. And we've seen a lot of school districts open around the country with very little transmission of the virus. And yet there have been others that have not had kids back in the classroom all year long. What's your own thought about that? Do we need to be returning kids to the classrooms? Is it safe to do so? Uh, and have we followed the science on this? Uh, uh, Paige, I think uh, there's no uh, one great answer to that. I think everybody wants kids back in school. And uh, we know just all of the great benefits of being uh, in school with their teachers, uh, having the kind of instruction and activities. And we've seen the downside of not doing that, uh, all the behavioral and mental health issues and the fall off in, in, in scholarly activity. So I think that the school systems that are moving forward with purpose uh, following the public health guidelines and also getting their teachers vaccinated. Uh, it's just sh uh, shocking to me that uh, teachers aren't on the front line of vaccination. Uh, we did, did that here in the District of Columbia with the uh, DC Health and the superintendent of uh, schools here, the DC public schools and charter schools, and got 4,000 teachers vaccinated uh, so that we could remove that as a hurdle to in-person instruction. And I think that's just so uh, critical. So as a children's hospital, we wanna do everything we can uh, to get the schools open and the kids back in school. Do you think that schools should require that teachers get vaccinated? You know, I, th I think the requirement uh, uh, thing, these vaccines are still in a sense experimental and they're being done uh, under studies by the FDA or under a, an exclusion by the FDA. So. I don't think that it uh, should be mandatory, but I think it should be offered so that every teacher uh, uh, that wants to get vaccinated should get vaccinated. I want to ask you more about the, the, the toll on kids that you mentioned earlier, the mental health toll. What are some ways that this has been playing out for kids, particular, particularly when we think of those who haven't been able to set foot in a classroom over the past year, who have you know, been home trying to do school perhaps, but not having those supports maybe that they would receive at school. What's been that impact that we've seen on our kids over this past year? Yeah, that's very insightful because uh, when you think about it, th these kids are, are, are isolated. They're not with their friends. They're not uh, doing the activities, getting ac exercises. They may not be eating healthy. Uh, they're on the screen looking at themselves all the time. And you just think about how that plays out uh, with all of the anxiety and stress that they may be feeling uh, themselves, and then also in their families. Just think about the, the, uh, uh, the dynamics uh, going on and the stress that uh, parents have. And then uh, they're not around uh, the teachers, they're not around the other caregivers that might identify early uh, issues or problems uh, that can be addressed. So we've are already, uh, it, you know, in our society, uh, mental and behavioral health of children is, is a big issue. 20% of kids will have some mental or behavioral health issue before, the, uh, before they turn 18. So now you put this pandemic on top of it, plus all of the different uh, activities that they uh, can't be doing. So we see depression going up, we see suicide going up, 
eating disorders because kids are looking at themselves and maybe don't like their uh, body image or they're eating more or not getting enough uh, exercise. We've had kids come in with uh, diabetes out of control that we hadn't seen before because of, of these issues. So this is a, uh, it, it's a real wave, a real tsunami that's, uh, that, that's coming through. And there's just, you know, we don't, we haven't been putting enough resources into this before the pandemic, and now it's making it even worse. So to help, I think getting the kids back into their regular activities, uh, getting them uh, uh, with their teachers, their friends, uh, but we also need, uh, we can't uh, declare that things are over uh, when they're back in school because these impacts, the loss of all of these things that have happened are going to be with them for a long, long time. We know Moderna and Pfizer have be begun coronavirus vaccine trials on kids. Um, but, you know, of, of course, kids are, are, you know, we've seen the lowest death rates among kids. And so they're sort of last priority in terms of getting the vaccine. But when do you think we can expect vaccines for kids? And should this be something that is sort of given automatically to every kid, almost like the flu, the seasonal flu vaccine? Yeah, that, no, that's where we need to get. It, it does need to uh, be where we're giving a universal vaccine to uh, children, just like we're giving every other uh, vaccine and every other type of viral uh, illness. This one's a little funny because it didn't, uh, you know, hasn't, uh, as we started out, hasn't impacted kids as much. So I have been concerned about the sort of slow study uh, and trials in children. Uh, we just started uh, being able to uh, vaccinate children that we care for with serious and chronic illness down to the age of 16, and nothing's been approved below that. And boy, are the kids and their families uh, so happy about that uh, because they know how critical it is to keep uh, these kids with serious illnesses. I think these studies, uh, as you say, have, have, have begun uh, and getting uh, at least down to age five, and I think there's some that are even going to be started uh, down into the uh, uh, down down to infants, and and we're hoping and we're close to uh, becoming a uh, trial center uh, for some of these studies here at Children's in, in Washington. Uh, but uh, it's going to uh, take some time to see uh, the safety and efficacy of these vaccines. So I'm not sure. We're hoping that uh, we'll be able to be doing this kind of thing before the next school season. But I think it's going to be a, a real uh, a tight race on that. Uh, and I know everyone's, of course, looking forward to getting back to normal. And we saw the president uh, talk about July 4th as a date when things maybe can feel more normal, uh, depending on how many adults get vaccinated. But what about families' summer travel plans, vacation plans? Say all of the adults in a family get vaccinated, but of course the kids haven't been vaccinated. Do you see any reason why they shouldn't be able to sort of be out and about and perhaps do some travel? Uh, no, I don't. I think if, if people are, are careful and, and maintain the, the regular public health measures of masking and social distancing and just being careful about that, I think there's so much good uh, that can happen uh, by families uh, where, where the adults have been vaccinated to have some time together, to take vacations, to uh, uh, decompress and, and really uh, you know, get back to those uh, happy family uh, at times. There's, there's just so much uh, good that can come out of that as we look to the long term for our, our kids and families. Well, I'm sorry to say we're out of time, but it was a great discussion. And thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Kurt Newman. It was great to have you on. Well, Paige, thank you. And, you know, the, the big uh, uh, thing here is for people to remember is that kids are affected and, you know, we really want to get ready and be prepared for that next pandemic and do all the research and, and, and so that we don't have to live through this again. And, and thank you for your attention to the children. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Please stay with us. I'll be back with science journalist and author Lori Garrett after this short video.
Welcome back. I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, and I'm delighted to welcome as my next guest, uh, author and journalist, Lori Garrett. And you may know Lori as someone who predicted the coronavirus pandemic years ago, and she's here to share with us her insights about what she's observed and learned over the past year. Thanks so much for joining us, Lori. Hi, Paige. Happy to be here. I want to start off by talking about, I think, something a lot of people are paying attention to, which is all of this news about the AstraZeneca vaccine and the fact that a number of countries in Europe have suspended the distribu distribution of that vaccine over concerns over side effects. Um, can you share with us your take on that? Do we see any actual evidence that these side effects are in any real way connected to the vaccine itself? Well, first of all, I think we should congratulate our Food and Drug Administration, uh, which looked at the AstraZeneca original phase three trial data back last October and said, boys and girls, you have to go back to the drawing board. This is not good enough study design, good enough execution of phase three trials to warrant an emergency use authorization from the United States government. And so indeed, AstraZeneca has been conducting an all new phase three trial to try to reach certification here in the United States. So the first thing Americans should know is we have this vaccine in freezers, but we're not putting it in people in America, pending a whole new set of basic research trial studies by the company. Now, what's going on in Europe is that this vaccine got an enormous amount of hype going back to early last summer. It was being talked about by Oxford University, which was bragging about its role in the whole effort, and AstraZeneca, the company, as if this was going to be the vaccine, the vaccine, and affordable to people in developing countries because it will be made using techniques and standards that are well understood and that can be done on a mass production basis. So it was all looking really promising. However, the very same difficulties with their original trial designs, which is to say executed differently in three different countries with three different doses and three different ways of testing the efficacy of the vaccine. Because of this, there has been a um, rising reluctance in Europe, one government after another, suspicious and demanding to know what sorts of specific agreements were made by the EU with AstraZeneca for purchasing at what prices and so on. So even before Norway saw four individuals throw blood clots and suspect that it was linked to the vaccine, uh, even before then, this was already a very controversial product for Europeans and already mired in a lot of disputes that were all the way down to the levels of individual country legislative bodies. And now comes this report out of Norway. Now, the issue is that, of course, in any sample of 100,000 people, you're going to have individuals that throw blood clots. It's just something that happens, you know, as a background rate, just like you're going to have people that have headaches and you're going to have women with menstrual irregularities or you're going to have a woman get pregnant. That doesn't mean the vaccine made her pregnant or the vaccine gave them headaches. And this is the issue with the blood clotting. Right now, it doesn't appear that the level of cardiovascular events in the form of blood clots is anywhere above the background noise level that one would expect in the same age group, in the same societies. So the WHO position is that there's no connection at all and that the vaccine remains safe. Um, but country after country across Europe has said, we don't trust this. And I honestly think, Paige, if there hadn't been this legacy of fighting over the actual contract deals, uh, whether or not the vaccine was overhyped to begin with in the summer, and then the difficulty with their trial design for their phase three clinical trials. If all that hadn't already been there, I don't think that the blood clot issue would actually be a big deal in Europe right now. But it, there's already a background of suspicion, and this just piles on. 
That that's absolutely fascinating, and I think a lot of Americans just see the headlines and hear there's some concern about the AstraZeneca vaccine, and that could lead to more hesitancy here. And I just want to say the numbers. So, uh, out of more than 17 million people inoculated with the vaccine, there have been 15 events of deep vein thrombosis and 22 events of pulmonary embolism. That's a tiny tiny number. And to your point, and I'm hoping you can hash this out a little bit more, you know, when you're vaccinating millions of people, you're going to have some small number of people encounter an adverse effect. And then it goes to this question of correlation versus causation. And I think a lot of people could get confused about that. Can you lay that out a little more clearly for our audience? Yeah, Paige, but first let's be very, very clear for the Americans in our audience. This vaccine is not, I repeat, not in use in the United States at this time. So all these sort of questions about the side effects of a vaccine are not relevant to the vaccines that are available to you as Americans, the Moderna, the Pfizer, the Johnson & Johnson, and soon sitting in the batting box, ready to come out with a home run, the Novavax vaccine, which appears to be 100% protective against uh, death and severe illness, uh, and based on their uh, trial results so far. So. What we're talking about is a, a problem in other countries, not in the United States at this time, and it should have no effect at all on your willingness to get vaccinated and to feel comfortable and safe um, that the balance between uh, any fantasized risk uh, versus the genuine risk of getting COVID and dying of it, that the, that weighs on the side of you getting vaccinated. Now, with every single drug or vaccine or medical product that is ever invented, there is this question of when you see a background rate of illness, is that causative or correlated? Um, you know, the best way to think about this is uh, inside of your body are literally billions and billions of microbes, viruses, bacteria, um, parasites, uh, of all different sizes, all different types, they outnumber your cells, actual, you know, in my case, Lori cells with Lori DNA in them are outnumbered 10 to one by all these other creatures inside my body. And uh, while it would be possible for me to look at any one of those bacterial populations and say, oh my goodness, I have to get rid of it. It's making me have headaches. It's making my vision blurred. It's doing this, it's doing that. The truth is they're, they're simply passengers inside of us and they don't, for the most part, cause any illness. In fact, they're essential to our proper metabolism and health. So when we look out at introducing additional factors into our human body, we always have to ask very, very carefully, can we design studies that tell us what's the difference between that sort of background gamish of stuff that's in our bodies, in our air, in what we breathe, and is our own sort of um, genetic constitution that affects our likelihood of coming down with one disease or another. Can we separate that from very specifically designed studies that tell us this product, this drug, this vaccine, this medical intervention causes this outcome? And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and the key to these trials uh, all along has been the study design for these vaccines done at Operation Warp Speed, by definition warp speed, meaning that trying to look at many things at once that typically in drug development would be done sequentially over a period of eight or 10 years and shrink that down to eight to 12 months with multiple factors studied all at the same time in parallel. I, and again, Paige, the problem with the AstraZeneca vaccine is that their study design for that in parallel examination of efficacy and safety and dosage and so on was very poorly done. What are the implications of pausing the distribution and administration of the AstraZeneca vaccine in these countries now, especially as I know some of these countries are, are starting to see yet another surge in cases? Well, I think the, the biggest risk here and it is huge, is that this is in a lot of the very same countries where well before there was COVID, 
there was already a huge amount of vaccine hesitation of parents refusing to vaccinate their kids against things like measles and whooping cough and adults refusing to get vaccinated for things like the human papillomavirus, the HPV vaccine or hepatitis B and so on, often on completely bogus and conspiratorial grounds. Um, so countries like France and Italy and Spain are amongst the highest vaccine hesitation or opposition populations in the world. Now you add something that seems like, you know, uh, to the average person, uh, grounds for questioning the validity of a given product. And it's just going to send vaccine hesitancy through the roof. It's a really big problem, especially if government leaders give mixed messages. At one point, uh, what, two years ago, Italy had a prime minister that actually opposed vaccination of children um, and appointed uh, top health leadership that spread false information about the safety of vaccines for children. Um, and the result was that they had a measles outbreak and it spread all over Europe. And we saw vaccine hesitant situations uh, in one country after another, from Romania to Hungary to France to Germany and so on. And, you know, it was a long slog to try and bring everything back from the brink and stop what became the largest measles epidemic uh, Europe had seen since uh, the invention of measles vaccines. Um, we were just on the cusp of conquering all this problem in Europe when COVID appears. And uh, now, well, it'll simply be background noise adding to the confusion with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Let's talk about the uh, virus variants for a minute. And I know this morning the CDC announced that it's seen these variants that were first identified in California that seem somewhat more transmissible. And of course, we've seen the other variants from, from other countries uh, outside the U.S. What's your own level of concern with the variants, both when it comes to the effectiveness of the vaccines against them and then also the perhaps additional transmissibility of these variants? I can't think of any issue uh, other than mask wearing and social distancing that has proven more controversial among science scientists and top medical experts than the relative risk assessment of these variants. Part of the thing is that, of course, Paige, it's not one variant. It's not one type of mutation. It's multiple different types of mutations that affect different aspects of the virus and its relationship both with cell entry, getting into human cells, and with the immune response against the virus and the ability of the virus to escape that immune response, escape antibodies. So we're actually not looking at one variant or two variants. Um, it's probably say easier for jargon to call them things like the UK variant and the South Africa variant, but actually these variants are all over the world, and wherever we look, we're finding them. If you don't hear a variant identified by a location, it's probably because nobody's really doing sufficient sequencing and surveillance to find them. So, so that gets to a couple things. One, they're all over the place. Two, the virus is mutating like crazy. We're in early stages with this virus. It's only been in our species for a matter of months. It's still adapting, mutating, and evolving right in front of us. And we're throwing things at it to hasten the evolution pace. You know, we're throwing uh, antiviral drugs, we're throwing uh, monoclonal antibodies, and we're throwing in some places uh, inadequate dosage of vaccines. All of it involving people who in some cases already have compromised immune systems, cancer patients, HIV positive individuals that are not adequately medicated to control their virus. Um, and, and a whole host of people with autoimmune diseases and so on. And so what we see here is a, a very, very complicated picture that says the virus is still trying to find exactly what its relationship should be with this species we call human beings. And our immune system is still learning to recognize this virus and to 
recognize it in a way that results in an appropriate uh, sequential immune response, triggering the correct parts of the immune system and not over triggering the immune system to result in what's called a cytokine storm where your whole lungs and your whole body is basically uh, being treated like carpet bombing attack on a village in order to stop an enemy, you know? Um, and so what I would say right now to try and help individuals assess how scared should you be of these variants is that the ones we, th there's two categories to think about. One are the ones that actually have figured out a way to spread more easily from person to person and thereby will increase the overall volume of disease out there, the volume of virus spreading. So the worst case scenario is the UK, which as of yesterday's sequential analysis, 98% of all new infections in the UK now involve mutant strains, particularly the B117 form, which we know is highly transmissible, um, probably on the order of 50 to 60% more likely to spread from person to person. And there is some controversy, but it does appear to be more dangerous once you are infected, more likely to produce a deleterious outcome. Um, and, and when we look at South Africa, where uh, close to 100% of all infections now involve a different mutant form that is an immune escape virus. So it has, it has responded to evolutionary pressure from antibodies by selecting four forms of the virus that can evade the antibodies. So your, bo your body might be making antibodies, a good strong immune response against the virus, but it's not doing any good because the virus has changed its outer coat, um, its so-called spike protein presentation in such a way that the antibodies are useless and the virus just escapes. Now, the former means the total burden of disease in a society will rise. The latter means individually the risk of infection is far greater. That well, that's, even that's, if you've that's, previously that's, been infected. That's 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 a really helpful response, and thank you. I know we're growing short on time, but there's one more quick question that I do want to ask you. Uh, we know that COVID-19 is a disease, of course, that jumped from animals to humans, but what about superbugs, uh, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, virus, and parasites, and how big of a threat are they? Oh, wow. Big change of subject, but super important. And of course, uh, three years ago, the United Nations held a general assembly session specifically on this point, describing it as the possible death knell of the efficacy of antibiotics if we don't, as a global community, address this crisis. Um, antibiotic resistance is, of course, as old as bacteria. As long as there have been bacteria around, competing with other kinds of microbial creatures, especially fungi, um, there have been antibiotics produced by their comp competitors to try and kill off bacteria. And uh, the resistance factors, the ability to stand up against antibiotics secreted by, say, a mold against a bacterium, uh, were often carried in this giant lending library that is the world of viruses and particularly very, very small viruses called phage. And these carry genes that can be popped in as needed inside bacterial genome to render it able to withstand, to fight against the uh, irrelevant antibiotic by altering some composition of the outside of the bacterium or by some other measure. Um, and what we've been doing as we throw more and more antibiotics willy-nilly, inappropriately, um, at both our pets and our livestock, uh, even crops, and of course, in, to us as human beings, is create more and more selection pressure that is resulting in bacteria in particular, pulling all the, from the lending library of the phage and viruses around them, all these resistance factors so that they mutate and become more and more drug resistant. And there are now effectively incurable bacterial diseases in the world, and they really defy all our available products. There are several things that the General Assembly determined had to be done. This includes, of course, hastening the pace of research and development for new types of antibiotics that are radically different, where the whole approach is different. One 
arena everybody's looking at is the utility of CRISPR technology, which is a whole long discussion we could have another time, Paige. Um, but uh, the other, of course, is to limit our use, especially in livestock, where the majority of all antibiotics are used. Well, thank you so much. And I'm sorry to say we're out of time, but this has been a great conversation. Always a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, Lori Garrett, thanks so much for coming on with us today. Thank you, Paige. Thank you. Stay with us. I'll be back with Dr. Tom Frieden in a few minutes. America's biopharmaceutical companies have one very important thing in common. A common enemy. We're making great progress because we're collaborating in ways that we've never done before. In a matter of weeks, we've progressed from potential treatments to antibodies and antivirals that have shown positive results to several promising vaccine candidates. Because science? Science. Science is how we get back to normal. Hello, I'm Elise Labitt from American University, and today we're talking about beating COVID-19 while preparing for the future. A year into the pandemic, we've seen during this COVID crisis how America's biotech companies have been working together to develop solutions to diagnose the virus, treat it, and prevent COVID-19 infections. And there's so much encouraging progress with the vaccine and the hope that the pandemic may soon be over. Joining me to talk about the lessons learned from COVID-19 and how the biopharmaceutical industry is preparing for the next public health emergency is Stephen Ubel, the CEO of Pharma, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Steve, welcome. Hi, Elise. Great to be with you. So we've seen this incredible partnership among the biopharmaceutical industry and researchers to fight it, both with therapeutics and vaccine development, Obviously, the agreement for Merck to help manufacture the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was remarkable. I know you consider it one of the industry's finest moments. So is this, you know, we've seen this kind of collaboration before between companies during World War II. Um, are these kind of partnerships the wave of the future? I think they are. Uh, you know, if you step back and think about where we are today with COVID-19, it's been about a year since the WHO uh, declared COVID-19 a pandemic. And, and in the early days of the pandemic, we really didn't have much to offer patients, you know, beyond supplemental oxygen and, and ventilation. And you fast forward to where we are today, where we have three vaccines that have been uh, authorized by the FDA and more on the way. And we have a variety of therapeutics that are helping to treat patients who have been infected with COVID-19. We have antivirals, anti-inflammatories, uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, that are being uh, used to keep patients out of the hospital and for those patients who are hospitalized uh, to avoid you know, severe uh, disease. So we've made a tremendous amount of progress and those partnerships have been key to our success. You know, the industry has really been working 24-7 uh, to combat the, the pandemic and they're, they're setting aside their normal competitive uh, juices, if you will, uh, to pitch in and, and help each other uh, develop and bring to market safe and effective vaccines and therapeutics. You mentioned J&J, uh, &J, uh, where Merck has stepped up, you know, their own vaccine candidate uh, encountered setbacks. So they've offered their manufacturing capacity to J&J. &J. You know, similarly, we have Amgen that has stepped up and agreed to manufacture Eli Lilly's uh, monoclonal antibody. And you have other companies like Sanofi and Novartis who are helping to manufacture uh, Pfizer's vaccine. Uh, so these partnerships are really, uh, really, really important to being able to scale up and bring uh, doses to patients. We've now had over 300 million doses of the vaccine uh, delivered in 110 countries, uh, which is remarkable uh, given where we are today. So the speed with which the industry was able to respond was also remarkable. I mean, talk to us about the ecosystem that enabled this all to happen and come together and be developed so quickly, both with the research done by the industry and the increase in manufacturing, but also the policy environment and working uh, with government agencies. Yeah, it, you know, the speed is, is no accident. In many ways, our, our companies had a hundred year running start. It's, it's what we do uh, in developing uh, therapeutics uh, to combat 
similar infectious diseases. So there are several keys uh, to success there. One is just deep scientific expertise gained over decades with similar diseases like MERS and SARS. Uh, our companies have also made significant investment in advanced manufacturing and other technologies. You know, back in the SARS pandemic, uh, it took uh, almost two years to get the first candidate vaccine into human trials. Uh, but because of new sequencing technology, we were able to get uh, the first uh, candidates, vaccine candidates for COVID into the clinic in, in a matter of weeks uh, or you know, a couple of months. Um, so those investments uh, in that deep scientific expertise have been key. You mentioned the partnership with government. You know, the, the industry has been working very closely with the FDA, NIH, and other stakeholders, you know, from the very early days of the pandemic. Uh, to try to come to agreement on standardized clinical trial approaches so that we didn't have a multitude of, of clinical endpoints that we were measuring, that companies could work together and actually have a common uh, clinical trial approach. Uh, we're also working with the government to, to evaluate supply chain uh, barriers uh, once we have safe and effective vaccines and therapeutics to get them to patients as quickly as possible. So ensuring uh, that, that all of the end-to-end uh, -end processes are in place uh, to allow uh, us to manufacture at scale. So I know uh, companies are already at work preparing for the next pandemic because we know this isn't going to be the last one. And as you take lessons learned from COVID-19, what is the industry focus on regarding future preparedness, not just regarding the threat itself of the virus, but thinking about innovations to the public health infrastructure? Yeah, let me start by just saying that, again, a key ingredient in our success has been the robust ecosystem that we have in the United States. We have a world-class regulator uh, where we have efficient, transparent uh, regulatory processes. We have world-leading academic centers that conduct clinical trials. We have a robust capital environment for the investment in literally hundreds of, of small biotech companies that, that we can partner with. We partner with academia and, and academic institutions can share in the fruits of any uh, product that is commercialized. We really have a unique uh, ecosystem in the United States that really facilitates innovation. So the first order of business is to make sure that we don't do anything uh, to harm that ecosystem. And unfortunately, you know, there are policymakers that are looking at policies that we think would harm the ecosystem, whether it's the government setting the price or determining the value of a medicine or uh, eroding intellectual property protections that have been absolutely essential to forging these in industry uh, cooperative agreements that we spoke about. So job one is, is maintaining this world leading ecosystem, uh, but we also have to look ahead at, at the next pandemic. You know, one of the things we've learned from COVID-19 is that unfortunately, you know, we've lost a half a million lives uh, to this uh, dreaded disease. And for people who are dying in hospitals, they're often dying of secondary infections for which there aren't effective uh, antimicrobial uh, agents. Uh, you know, we have a superbug problem emerging where a lot of those patients have been treated with existing uh, medicines, uh, which unfortunately leads to more resistance uh, to the antibiotic medicines that we have today. Um, so we need to develop new antibiotic medicines uh, for the future. Uh, and it's a challenging uh, market dynamic because you're essentially developing a medicine that you hope that never gets used. Uh, and as a result, uh, not a lot of small companies in particular have engaged in research in that space. So our industry has stepped up uh, and actually pledged a billion dollars to try to bring four new antimicrobial uh, agents to market by, by 2030 by helping smaller companies through this uh, valley of death, if you will, where they need to be able to attract, attract investment and make progress in that space. So that's just one area that we think needs uh, greater attention going forward. Well, and obviously all the companies are continuing to work together now and in the future. Steve Ubel, CEO of Pharma, the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Elise. We'll throw it back to the Washington Post.
Welcome back to the program. If you're just joining us, I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, and I'm delighted to welcome as my next guest, Dr. Tom Frieden, President and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives, and of course, uh, former head of the CDC. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Frieden. Great to be with you, Paige. I want to start out by asking you about this CDC guidance that we saw recently released, and there's been a lot of debate and some criticism of it uh, among scientists and experts, epidemiologists. Uh, would like to get your take on that guidance and specifically the question of whether the agency is being too conservative in terms of its recommendations of what people can do once they're vaccinated. I think this is going to change with time because the more of us get vaccinated, uh, the safer we'll all be. And the fact is there are lots of things that you can do uh, once you've been vaccinated, hug your kids, get that haircut or dental checkup that you were waiting for. Uh, and there's certain things you shouldn't do. You shouldn't get rid of your mask. Uh, you shouldn't uh, take excessive risks with lots of people. Remember, no vaccine is 100%. Uh, I think we get into this dichotomy of saying it's gotta be completely safe or completely risky. and Fact is, there are a lot of gray areas. So um, I think the CDC got it pretty much right. Um, it's really easy to criticize from the outside, but they're balancing a lot of considerations. I do think it will change with time and it will change as we learn more about the vaccine. For example, just in the past week, new information has come out that suggests that in fact, the vaccine will reduce the risk that you can spread the infection to others, not completely, but, but quite substantially. In the past few weeks, we're seeing really terrific results of the vaccination saving already thousands of lives, particularly in nursing homes and for people over 65 more generally. So vaccination is definitely the way to go, but we've also got variants coming. And uh, we already know that there are variants that do appear to overwhelm your prior immunity from infection. So far, uh, the vaccines look pretty good, especially the ones being used in the US against the variants. But to me, basically, those earlier variants are a shot across the bow telling us that, hey, you know, when enough people have vaccine-induced immunity, it's possible that if the virus is still spreading uncontrollably or uncontrolled, I should say, uh, that, that it could develop um, a, a vaccine escape strategy. So we have to keep our guard up. And I think that was the essential point behind the guidance. And I think that was essentially right. But I just want to press a little bit more on the CDC guidance. And that is some, probably what's been the most criticized is, you know, the CDC is saying, OK, you get the vaccine, you're exposed to somebody with the virus, you don't need to quarantine after that. Yet on the other hand, they're saying even if you get fully vaccinated, you shall, still shouldn't be traveling. And I guess my question to you is, A, is that the right way to go? Should people not travel still, even if they've gotten the, the vaccine? Uh, and then also, if does the CDC risk losing the trust of people if they're seen as sort of unrealistic on this guidance? So travel is, is an interesting one. I will say that before their guidance came out, I had uh, uh, discussed about post-vaccination and I had said, take that long awaited vacation. Now, um, so I think there's a travel is more of a gray area. I would say, let's take two extremes. Um, an older couple is gonna go in their RV to a campsite in a different state and stay pretty isolated from others and wear a mask when they go into the supermarket. I don't see a reason not to do that. On the other hand, uh, uh, a family with people who have underlying conditions, who've been vaccinated, um, but for example, someone whose immune system may not respond great to the vaccine or we're not sure it'll work. Uh, they're now heading to a huge family reunion in a place where the virus continues to spread widely. Not a great idea. So I think that's probably something that requires a little bit more finely graduated um, uh, assessment. Um, on the broader issue of maintaining trust, I do think it's important to be realistic. And one of the things that we're going to have to do going forward is recognize that things are changing. Uh, the two things that are changing are that because of vaccination, we are essentially converting uh, this, vir <clears throat> this virus into a less deadly virus. So because of vaccination, the risk of every 100 people who get it, that they're going to die, 
is falling substantially because the most vulnerable people are getting vaccinated. The second is we don't know what the variants will do. The variants really are a wild card. And I think either side of this argument, the, the folks who say, you know, don't worry about the variants, we can manage them, with the folks who say variants are going to undermine our control, we don't have evidence for either of those positions. We have to tell it like it is. And the fact is the variants are definitely a risk and we definitely don't know how big a risk they will be for us. So we need to be careful. You participated in a focus group over the weekend that was asking Trump voters how they could best be persuaded to take the vaccine. And I know these were voters who say they're not anti-vax, but they have some hesitancy. What was your takeaway from that group about reaching this particular group of voters? It was very interesting. Um, they feel disrespected. They feel that the vaccine, the virus, the response has been politicized. They don't want to hear from any politicians, not even former President Trump, who they are strong supporters of. And they had rational, important questions. And it's important that we in the health system answer their questions. They wanted to know, for example, their most common question was, how do you know for sure that there won't be some long-term bad complication of this vaccine? And that's a totally legitimate question. And the honest answer is, I can't tell you for sure that there will not be some rare bad reaction to this vaccine because it hasn't been around for a long time. I can tell you, however, that if you get the virus, you are much more likely to have a long-term bad effect if you don't get very sick or die, even though there are many people who are gonna to be totally fine with very mild illness after the virus. I can tell you with certainty that the vaccine will make it much less likely that you'll get very sick from the virus. And um, I can uh, demystify some of the things. Uh, it, people were suspicious that the uh, vaccines were approved so quickly. Well, that wasn't a year, it was more than a decade of research. And it wasn't uh, uh, corners that were being cut, it was red tape. And the studies that looked at the vaccine weren't with a small number of people, they were five or 10 times larger than the usual vaccine studies we do. So facts like this actually moved the group, but I think what moved the most was listening, being listened to, uh, having their concerns taken seriously as they should be, and taking it out of the political arena, not making it a political issue. And the other thing that was clear is don't ever talk about masks and vaccines in the same discussion with this group, because you, you will not get anywhere on the mask issue, leave it aside, focus on vaccination to help us all get back to work, get back to the lives uh, that we want to live more fully. Recent polls have, have shown that uh, a relatively small, a relatively large number of Republican leaning voters say they're hesitant about the vaccine. Are you concerned that we have enough people in the U.S. who will refuse to take the vaccine that it could get in the way of us getting to herd immunity this year? Well, first off, herd immunity isn't like a light switch on and off. Uh, the more of us who get vaccinated, the safer we'll, be, we'll all be. And the clear lesson for our program from this group was, let's get vaccine into doctor's offices as soon as possible, because their own doctor will be the strongest messenger here. So as we get the J&J &J vaccine, as we get more of the vaccines available, having it available as part of routine healthcare will be very important. We need multiple platforms for vaccination, pharmacies, uh, pop-up places, uh, health department, schools, other places where you can vaccinate large numbers of people, but also doctors, offices, and outreach into communities where uh, people are, meet people where they are, reduce the barriers to vaccination. What we know is convenience often overwhelms a little bit of reluctance. For the people who definitely don't want a vaccine, we hope they'll come around. But this was more a group that was willing to be persuaded. They had to be listened to. And this is a broader issue, Paige. We need to think about what to do next to make sure that this country and the world is better prepared, not just for this pandemic, but for future risks as well, by having a clear accountability, a clear set of goals, clear understanding that it's now or never, that our security and safety in the US is inextricably linked with improving global preparedness and that we have to do a much better job improving our public health systems and our primary health care systems and the resilience that people have individually as communities, both in the U.S. and around the world. 
Let's talk about another hot button debate, which is over three feet versus six feet between students at schools. And as you know, many districts have opened around the country uh, with little transmission. And, you know, I think of my own kids school where they've been three feet apart and we've had almost no cases this year. What's your own thought on that? And should the CDC consider revising their guidance to say it's safe to have three feet between students? Well, safe is a four letter word that begins with S. Uh, because frankly, you, you have to be honest here. Uh, look, 100 feet is safer than six feet, which is safer than three feet. Uh, is three feet okay for most schools? Absolutely. If they mask, if they rapidly identify cases and isolate and quarantine well, there's no one thing that's going to make a difference. We need a layered approach and uh, increasing ventilation will be important. But you have to be practical about what's needed because it's really important that our kids get back to school learning in person. That can make a huge difference. We need to do that as soon as possible. And sure, if you can have more distance, great. Uh, three feet plus masks, plus a good system for finding and stopping cases from spreading, plus practical ways, if you can increase ventilation, all of those are going to be important. And of course, getting teachers vaccinated. What's your take on the timeline that President Biden has laid out, uh, you know, opening up eligibility to adults by May 1st, having enough vaccines for everybody by June, and then the hopes of things feeling normal by July 4th? Well, um, let's hope the manufacturers continue to deliver the number of doses they are. This is a great accomplishment. Um, there's always a risk of a manufacturing problem, but if that doesn't happen, I think we're well on the way to opening this up widely. Then by May or June, instead of not having enough vaccines for arms, the challenge will be, do we have enough people willing to get the vaccine into their arms? So not enough uh, people willing to be vaccinated. And that's why we really need to expand the platforms for vaccination. If we do that, I do think we'll be getting toward normal over the summer. And if the variants don't become very concerning, don't spread widely, then by fall, we really will be at the new normal with in-person schooling, uh, in-person work, and um, increasingly ability to go back to entertainment and crowds and movies and other things. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you so much for joining us for this conversation, Dr. Tom Frieden. Thank you very much. Pleasure speaking with you. Well, please come back and join us tomorrow at noon for a conversation between my colleague Francis Stead Sellers, uh, who will talk to Lori Santos and Ariana Huffington about self-care. I'm Paige Winfield Cunningham, and thank you so much for joining us today.